Well, in a moment, we're going to go right into an activity, but since I have the chance to just be with you for a moment first, I'd love to find out what you're all studying. I right, checked in with this table. So may I hear some of your majors, please? Marketing, entrepreneurial management, finance, quite a few. How many in finance? Just let me see it. OK, good. OK, we got it. That. Thank you. Yeah. Supply chain, That's, uh, more than one supply chain, OK. Management, all, all kind of businessy. Anybody, anybody not? All businessy. OK, didn't know that. Good. Uh, well, this will be really fun then. So as Mary said last week, I was with our newest crop of leaders, and this is just in our, what we call the Western Cluster. Um, you know about Gore. You all read the article. Yes? OK. And then, did you all know about Gore-Tex jackets before that? Some of you did. Some of you didn't. OK. We also make medical devices. One of my favorite products is we, we plug the holes in baby hearts. Seriously, when they're, when they're born with a little hole between the two valves, it's, it's like a little butterfly. And it goes in without even opening them up anymore. And it just opens up like two little butterfly wings. And then the body heals around it. So it's just a miracle. So it's, it's a really cool company to work for because we do things that are like that. But we're in the Mars rover as well. Very fun. Um, we're at the edge of all of our industries. Uh, we, you know, we do the stuff that only the top of the industry would know they even need, which is a real interesting place to play. So other than the Gore-Tex jackets and our bike wear and um, running wear, those are only branded all the way through products. Um, we are selling to experts, not mass production, not, not mass um, customers. So it's, it's really different. It is absolutely an innovation company. We were designed for it. Everything we do is in service to it. The reason this topic is really important to us and that we would teach every new leader is that we are an innovation company. And innovation is fraught with contradictions. That's how most innovation works. There's a really cool example of an innovation in this room right now if you look to the windows. How do we let light in but keep privacy? OK, so usually to let light in, you have to have an open window. But you could even use this in a very private space, right? And they couldn't see in. And so it's the contradictory properties of having light and no visibility instead of light and visibility. Those are two opposite states. And often what happens in innovation is that you are trying to transcend two opposite states. So if you think about it, if you're dealing with opposites all the time, well, that requires you to be really agile. And so what we find is that when I go to most companies, people don't really get similarities. I'm just going to set you up right now. If you get a headache, this is why, all right? Because it, it's, it's really seen as a difficult task to hold opposites in mind at the same time. And so we, we're going to ask you to do that. And I mean at the same time. It's called simultaneity, opposites at the same time. Not just this sometimes and this sometimes but together. And the reason I think that we're really you know, agile around this at Gore is because of our number one product, which those of you who know about Gore-Tex fabrics, the, the theme is breathable and waterproof. Okay? And so you can, you know, it's breathable so you don't sweat in the jacket, but it keeps the rain out. Well, it's water droplets either way. That's a contradiction. The water, can, water vapor can go out, but the rain can't come in. And so we have people who are at the front desk or doing housekeeping in our factories, and, and they'll say, oh, it's another polarity. And yet I can go to NASA, and they're like, polarities, yeah, we're working on that. Interesting, but it's, it's a part of our life that we know that opposites can exist at the same time. So we're going to get into this just for a little warm-up. Are we ready? OK, you'll tell them what to do, please. Yes. So, so at your tables, help each other. There are going to be four images that you're going to see. And there are two meanings in each image. Help each other at your table until you can see both meanings. OK, so at your table, discuss them until you can see them.
Okay. So do, everybody got across the line? Everybody can see both images. Okay, let's take another one. Oh, we're, we're still coaching over here. <laughs> and I, if you can't see it right away, notice what it's like when you get it, when you get the other side. Okay, are you ready for the next one? Whoopsie. Okay, now make sure everyone at your table gets it. Has everybody got it? This is an oldie. Can you all see it? Okay. Everybody good? Everybody got it? Okay, next one. There's two things going on here. There's two things going on. When you get it, it's going to be so obvious. <laughs> Remember that feeling. <laughs> okay, did everybody get both? You got both? Everybody, don't, let it, don't leave anyone behind. Okay, and one more. One more. I wish I had a video of all of you going like this. <laughs> so everybody got the two meanings. Copy the people around you and see what they're, what are they doing in order to see it. I think this one's still leaving people behind. Can somebody come up and show us? So, somebody, somebody come up and show the two images. Yeah, would so, someone come up and show the two images? Come on up, please. And now what, notice how he's going to show us, OK? So there's a frog. Here's the eye. It's got its hind legs. Okay. Now if you shift and look at it this way, this is the nose of a horse. There's the mouth. There's the mane here. Whoa. Okay. Thank you for doing that. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, now, has everybody seen both meanings? Okay. You've all got it? Did at least... Did you have at least one time where you just didn't get it and didn't get it and didn't get it and then you got it? Okay. That's what I want you to remember. Because when we have polarities in business, it's like that. And you will have people stake their whole careers on it being a frog. And you know it's a horse. Yeah, I'm serious. I mean, whole companies have gone down the path of this is a frog, I'm telling you it's a frog, and if you don't believe it's a frog, then you can find a job somewhere else. When it is a frog and it is a horse. And some people can see the horse. So that's why we're gonna spend some time doing a little brain agility today. But this is a fun warm up because this is what it's like. And if you can call it when you're in a meeting and say, I suspect we have a polarity here and not a problem. And we'll look for what are the symptoms of a polarity. And we'll look at what you do about it when you think you've spotted one in the wilderness. Because the person who's able to call it and frame the conversation around it is going to be the person who can then really lead. And I'm presuming that you'd all like to know how to lead when you get out there in those jobs that you're pursuing. So if we can switch to slides and we're ready, we're, let's, uh, 
Actually, what we're going to do is we'll do a definition because I work in a global audience, so we always do definitions first. Our Japanese friends remind us if we forget. I'll tell you, it's the first time I taught in Japan. I was like, boy, they're so rude. They keep pulling out their mobile phones, and you know what they were doing. Does anybody know? Yeah, they were looking up, um, they were looking up words. They asked me not to quiet down my language, not to make it easier language. That's part of their practice. I would look up to find the definitions of words and the pronunciation and so forth. So talk about putting a frame on something that wasn't appropriate. I learned quickly to offer definitions and to not assume the worst of people when they pull out their mobile phones. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to look at optimizing polarities. You looked at the images. We did that. Here's the uh, definition. It's just straight out of the old internet. Um, but it's a, a polarity, meaning poles. The quality or condition that exhibits opposite properties, that's what I really want you to hold on to, or powers in opposite directions. And you know what? You really feel a pull. When you encounter these in business, you really feel pulled to one side or the other. So it's, it can be very dividing among teams. And the ability to call it and then to have people actually map out the polarity lets them see the choices they have in front of us instead of going with what they first see. Um, so here are some examples. Now the inhale, exhale one is tough for me because in a way that's not simultaneously. Uh, but at the same time, if, I, if you really found yourself getting attached to, I really prefer inhaling, that doesn't make any sense because you can't have an inhale without an exhale. So it, a lot of times it'll just feel like a cadence or you know, a rhythm to your work that has to have both sides. Um, we often talk about it's a left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot feel of things, but you really have to do honor to both sides of the, of the phenomenon. And then support and challenge is one we talk about a lot. I don't know if you ever bring situational leadership as a topic in, but it's great for early leaders. But situational leadership is, you know, first was Hersey and Blanchard, and then um, Blanchard, they both went out on their own. So you can buy these products. And if you ever have a chance to get trained in it, it's a wonderful early leader skill. But it has to do with understanding that when adults learn things, they go through two stages. They go through stages of competence and confidence. And I bet everyone in here is, has started to learn something, but you really don't want to be found out you don't know it well. Well, that's a perfect example. You're starting to get some competence, but you're not confident about it yet. And there are other stages where we're too confident. We think we can just you know, sail through something, but we're not competent yet. That's really dangerous. You know, like 15-year-olds who say, I know I can drive. I haven't done it yet, but I've watched my dad do it for years. Just hand me the keys. That's a case of too much confidence and not enough competence. Well, it's this cadence, this moving back, this rhythm between the two is how we grow, how we learn, how we adapt in our careers and in what you're doing in school. I'm sure that you have wavering times of confidence. Is that fair, fair enough, <laughs> really? And then you have times when you feel like you finally got it. Okay, so these are things that we see a lot. Um, one that we deal a lot with in our company, uh, if you read the case study, did it mention our value for a long-term view? Okay, that language is really important. We have a new leader we just um, hired in from DuPont because Dow bought DuPont and a lot of great talent was available right there. Very traditional company, so it's a little bit of a shaky start here, but uh, a really fine person who really gets our, our culture and wants to contribute in it. And I asked him after about six months, what do you love most about being here? And the first thing he said was that long-term view. You know, to get off that quarter to quarter reporting to the, you know, an externally held stock market, you know, that's just, it's just such a difference. You just are able to breathe in a company that can, can do the kind of commitment to uh, some of the products we're in. Um, I don't know if you know, but medical devices, um, the, the soonest you can get anything out if you invented it today is seven years. And most of them take maybe 15, 20 years to get any kind of profit back. So... Um, the same thing with Gore-Tex Fabric, uh, after 20 years of investment in R&D, they burned the promissory note in the parking lot. 20 years till it turned a profit. You don't find a lot of companies with that kind of, of um, attitude or, or persistence. So this idea of important now and important for the future, well, we'll go out of business before then if we don't take care of business now financially. But you have to be investing enough if you really want to 
maintain yourselves as a product leader for always having a future that you're investing in at the same time, sometimes over many, many years. So this is a polarity map. Okay, in the case of this one, <laughs> I'm going to just show you, we're going to, I'll come around the table, let me give you the whole scheme of what we're going to do here. I'm going to demonstrate for you a polarity on this map. And the polarity I'm going to demonstrate is this one, individual and team. Do you do a lot of teams here? Yeah, like, okay, now, by just the way you nodded your head, I'd say some of you are thrilled about that and some of you are not. <laughs> so you're going to help me fill in what are the upsides and downsides of an individual focus and a team focus, and I know you know this. You're living it probably. Uh, we're going to do that. Then what we'll do at our your tables is everybody should have a big map like this, right? That's your own. And I'll come by and give each of you a set of cards that reflect a polarity. And they're different colors because there are different polarities. What you're going to do, and I'm just telling you ahead of time so you pay attention during the demonstration, okay, is you'll lay these out. If you'll put your poles down, your white cards go here and here. And then you'll sort your colored cards if you think that is a positive aspect of one of the poles or a negative aspect of one of the poles. Okay. Then here's the hard part. After you both really get this polarity, I need you to each table to come up with an example that you've seen or lived. Okay, it can be from personal lives, but let's go for business. You're all in business. Okay, so you might have to like rip it from the headlines like the show says, or maybe you've heard about it at home or whatever, but I need a real life example from your table, just one. So at least you can work together on that. So you know what the assignment's gonna be. You're gonna get your cards, you're going to sort them out. Then, actually, you're going to come up and demonstrate yours to teach the rest of the room. And you've got to have a live example. Okay? So with that note, everybody head to the front of the room. Okay. Just come on around our map here. Let me see. I think I'll quickly write it down so we get it framed in our heads. All right. You see, this is our big polarity map. Somebody have a good size marker they can write individual and team for me on these? Anybody have a marker? You got a marker? Yeah, Sharpie will do it. I just, it's easier to sort in your head. I don't know which one's working. Yeah, anything over. Thank you very much. Individual and team. And we'll do individual over here. Okay, so thank you for doing that. Um, so I am a remote associate. In other words, I'm the only person who works in Austin, Texas for my company. Okay, I've, I essentially go on the road and I work with leaders wherever they are. Individual here. Thank you very much. Team over there. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, so um, I, <laughs> I clearly get the upsides of working alone. Okay, I, I would say I spend 45% of my time working alone, the rest of the time on the road around the world with our leaders. Uh, it's just me and my dog. Okay, yes, I know that makes it good already, doesn't it? <laughs> my, the music I want, don't have to argue with anybody about it. Okay, no, no drive-by interruptions, people stopping by and saying, what do you think? It's awesome, love it. Now that's my story about the upsides of individual work, but what are some of yours? What do you love about it? Anybody? Own your own schedule? Yeah, right. Own schedule. What else? Doing one of the weird tasks of <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Don't argue with myself often. Mm -hmm. Right. Nice. What else? What do you like about that? What's the upside of individual? It is. It's rewarding personally, and it's easy to reward me because everyone knows it was my work. Oh, does that one hit home for anybody? <laughs> Thought it might. Okay, what are some other upsides of working alone? I'm confident with my abilities. <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. Great. Thank you. You can stick to the process that you know. Yeah. yeah. Very true, isn't it? Yeah. A few more. Upsides. Think about your own work. And when you do it, your own schoolwork by yourself versus in teams. You can learn better. Yeah, interesting. Sometimes yes and sometimes yeah. So what about the learning piece? Sometimes it causes you to like slack off and procrastinate. 
listening and put things off kind of? It could because there's a different kind of accountability, mm -hmm. right? And people aren't counting on you. What about the learning side of things? You also learn it your own way in a sense that it makes it yep. that you know it best. And the upside of that is it feels good. I might as well head down here. What's some of the downside about learning when you're working on your own? You might not get to learn what other people can teach you when you're on your own. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, just that interplay or that different point of view. I might go through life thinking it's a frog. <laughs> you know? Yeah, what else? What's some of the downsides there of working? There might be a faster way to do things. There might be a faster way, yeah. And I won't know it until provoked, yeah. What else? Downsides of working alone. Yeah, that's quite possible. Because, why? Because you don't have like a bunch of different people to generate ideas with. Yes. So you don't know if you're coming up with the best option. Very true, very true, yeah. Self-complacency. It could be, yeah, so you can get that into, too into yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and not outwardly focus, or it feels like discipline. You could be less motivated. Yeah, motive, so uh, notice that we're talking about motivation and quality of content. I think it's true, don't you? So what's my solution? Okay, I've been too long in Austin, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> you would all know this, but at the same time, I miss my colleagues. Okay, so clearly the answer is to seek out the upside of working together. So that's why I really am careful about scheduling my work as a remote associate. And many of you are gonna be gig economy people. I'm an internal, but I'm almost gig inside my company, I set up my projects, I have clients inside and things like that. And I know if I've gone too long and too deep and too into research that it's time for a really good social project. So what do you think I'd be seeking? What upside of team would I be seeking? The community aspect. The, the community is huge. Other ideas. Other ideas, absolutely, yes. Feedback from their ideas. Yes, yes. And sometimes being told, wow, are you out of date, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right, yes. Upsides a community, upsides a team. Accountability? Yes, there is a different accountability. Part of it's personal, because that's how I am. I really want to, but part of it's like we all set up our own schedules. Anybody do anything on Scrum or Agile or things like this for programming yet? I advise you to go out and learn about it whether you're programming or not, because the application to work teams in, in companies is really cool. And that's just getting ready to really take off if it hasn't where you are already. Some of you, who knows about it already? Who are resource people in the room? Take a look, okay? Go ask them. <laughs> ask them about it. It's really, really exciting. So upsides of team, what about in your, in your schoolwork? What are the upsides of team? Anything more? Can you have help? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, I know what I want to hear that I haven't heard yet. Upsides of teams. Delegation. <laughs> Delegation or at least distribution. Fair enough? <laughs> Little difference, though? Okay, come on, you read the Gore case study. Why would I change it to that? Because we don't have managers, remember? 10,000 people know managers. It's all about distributing the work, not telling someone else to do it. But yes, because if I'm really good at these five things, and I really am not good at these eight things, but I'm really smart about who I'm on teams with, we all get to do the stuff we love the most. And that's part of the secret of our company. However, you can spend too long in teams. What are some of the downsides? I know you know them. Yeah, what do you do when not everybody's equally committed, <laughs> right? What else? Groupthink, group yeah, yes. And you, does everybody know what groupthink is? Yeah, they say that you can get the most diverse group of scientists, and if they work together two years, they're pretty much of the same mind. Two years, and most executive teams are together way longer than that. Yeah, it's very dangerous. What else? Downside of teams. Yes. Natural, right? Absolutely. How about rewards and grades and all that? Yeah. How do you know? How do you? How does an external know who really brought it? Um, I taught at UT, the other school, the one down there, and uh, did the little thing where you give the whole team the grade. 
you know, this team gets 93 points, you figure out how it will average out to that. <laughs> you know, you figure out who gets the grades, and they could then decide as a group. It would take hours sometimes, and they, usually someone would leave the room not happy. But, um, but at the same time, if they knew that that was it up front, then they, most people would bring it. But it's really hard in a business setting to be fair with the pay because you never know who really brought it at any one time. Who had that, that big idea? Well, if you're a really good team, you don't know. You don't remember who had the idea. It really was both of you. But rarely are people paid the same. So what you see, you see the dynamic here, yes? So you've got two things, and you're trying to get the best of both. But they, they really are conflicting. There are conflicting needs to do this well. So you've got enough of how this works. You, so I'm going to give you some real life business polarities. You're going to sort them out on your mat. And then you're going to find some way that when it's time, you're going to come up here and teach us your polarity and have a real life business example. OK? Well, let's head back, and I will hand them out. Just let you pick. Want to pick? Anybody? You don't know what they are, so. <laughs> pick one. <laughs> there you go, and here you go. Think so? Uh -huh. Good. So I pulled one out, so I think I did all, f I had five and, five, or maybe four, so I think two group. Yeah, two, yeah. We'll see. How are we doing for time? I always lose track. There's no clock up there. Oh, yes, thanks. And it's the 320. Good. <laughs> yeah, because if, if we have, um, so we'll let, of the two, of the four that share two, we'll have one walk it, and then they each give their story. Okay. Sure, sure, because they can put their own down. When does that? We'll see, we'll be able to tell if they need help, right? Oh yeah, they're fine. Okay. They are used to doing that.
I mean, how are you, I do want you to read them because you're the only one that had the blues. Uh -huh. um, so I don't know. I brought tape if you want to tape we them just down. Do one or we do one? You 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 want to actually walk it. So the upside of this side is, and the downside of this side is, just like I did. And then the end. And then, yeah, or or work it through either way you want to do it. Okay, because you can actually put these white things down. So I I'll leave some tape in case that helps. <laughs> So you're the only green table, so you will definitely be walking it. So just like I walked in, I, you, do, you can actually read these. Some people might disagree with you on some yeah. of these. That's okay. That's cool. Just have a good explanation. We disagreed with ourselves on yeah. some of them. Perfect. <laughs> and it, it'll, you'll teach better if you share those. Yeah. Okay, good. And I don't know if you want to just tape them down or how you're going to do that. But um, you'll put the white ones so we can actually see, and then you'll, okay? So there's two of these tables. Um, so one of you will actually walk the map, you know, like I did, and read these because everybody else had different ones. Okay. And then be sure to either work in your example or tell it at the end. Okay. okay. So I brought tape if you want to tape it down if it's easier or however you want to do that. Okay. So two of you have this color. Only one of you has to actually read them all in each quadrant. Like, oh, like, okay. okay. But you, each of you has to have your own example. Okay. So you, we each have to have our own example. 
Has yes. You, no, 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 no. Your table gets oh, okay. to have one example. It's okay. <laughs> so, just one. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Certainly. So are we close? You're done. Good. Are you you're ready? How about two minutes? Oh, familiar because you like know Two minutes, or you're ready? You're good. You are you set? Good. And you know how you're gonna. Did you, you can choose, yeah, see who's willing to walk it and then be, have that person, be, that group be ready. Are you going to walk the map or are they going to walk the map? Good, cool. Okay, and that's the case. Do you want to grab the tape and tape it down or how are you going to do it? Are you dividing them up? Some teams are, you know, one will stand in each one and they'll divide them up or do what you need to do to get it done, okay? Okay, so about. About another minute and a half, we'll start. <laughs> okay, we could advance to. Uh, yeah, thanks. Perfect. Two. There you go. All right. That's what they're doing now. Yes, I did just check. That group needed one more minute. Okay, let's um, begin to head up here. Bring your cards. Come this way. All right, let's head up. Everybody this way. You want to go first? Sure. It's called getting it over with. <laughs> and your white cards, put them down so we can see them. There we go. Excellent. You got your ups. Good. So you're setting a good example, being brisk and ready to go. Come on up, everybody. Yeah, uh, pants? Okay, everybody head up. <coughs> and this group's going first, claiming the board. Now be sure that when you're describing it that you're in the correct quadrant. Okay? Yes. <laughs> Familiar and more easily integrated. Preserves harmony and calm. We must protect our intellectual property based on our unique know-how. And we don't need others to tell us what to do. And then for the negatives, um, we may try to be tasks others can do faster and or better. And our example for this one was, um, like, at my internship, I could, sometimes I've, like, worked on something Excel for, like, hours. And then when I go to my manager, she's like, what are you just coming to us at? It'll save you tons of time. So <laughs> I didn't collaborate. So when I was really focusing, I took too much time in arranging things. Right? And then we can miss opportunities for valuable collaboration. We can miss complexities in our industries or markets, and we can't afford the time and money to keep up with every technology change. Okay. Does everybody know what this would be like? You got what the issue is? If a company is too internally focused, like we are the only ones who know how to do it, versus outsourcing or otherwise leveraging external capabilities. Good. So let's see our other side. So the positives for external is puts new ideas in the mix and challenges the status quo, provides environmental knowledge we might not have, we might develop deep knowledge in others instead of ourselves. We also have a quicker buy-in from associates and teams, and can be surprising and reveal blind spots. <laughs> <laughs> to use external focus? Oh, 
Come on, you can challenge them, guys. Come, did you catch these last two? So which of these might be a little bit, hmm? Is it an upside to develop deep knowledge in others instead of ourselves? So in other words, let me give you an example. So Gore's like, really, we're a trade secret company. We're not just, not just you know, patents, trade secrets. I mean, like, we don't even go get patents because they run out. So we don't want anybody to know how we do our stuff. OK, does that make sense? We don't, we don't want anybody to know how to do our stuff. So do you think we're going to very quickly ask that little factory down the road to outsource our assembly of medical devices? No, because we would be really worried about developing them, getting them smarter than we are. You know, maybe they'd get so smart at us that they'd even compete. There you go. Good job. Good job. Good job. See <laughs> Quicker buy-in from associates and teams. Now, associates is what we call our, our, our employees, OK? Um, and if they've got jobs right now, and they love their jobs. Do you think they're happy about outsourcing or unhappy about outsourcing? Unhappy about outsourcing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so you got to really listen for these, okay, and challenge each other. But these are the real things you're going to run out there and run into. Nice. Thank you very much. Very adaptive of you all there too. Uh, <laughs> downsides. It can feel more expensive. Now, I had a group just last week argue that one out. So we've got a lot of finance people in the room, and we've got others who are in more managerial and things like that. Figure out why they could feel both ways about that one. So read it for us again. It feels more expensive. OK, so insourcing versus outsourcing. Why could, why could they argue it both ways, that it could feel more expensive? Sure. Yeah, so in that case, it could feel more expensive to be inside if you can go get lower rates and such. But in what ways can it feel more expensive when you go outside? You feel like you're wasting time. That could be, yes. That would be a great system view piece of it, yes. Um, let's just say it's, um, I'm in training and learning and all that, um, and I could either sit in my office and <coughs> make all the stuff, or I could have someone do it outside. If I do it myself, I don't have to get an invoice and pay it. If I do it outside, I get an invoice and pay it. It feels more expensive, but if you see what I'm actually writing the check for versus my salary, my benefits, my everything else. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. So it, that's why the word feel is important. So you can. You did a really great job of arguing it both ways, by the way. OK, did you have any, any other example or is it the one you gave us? Good. Thank you very much. This is the only blue ones, internal, external, bravo, golf clap. OK. <laughs> Okay, pick those up. Let's get away to another one. And you modeled it perfectly for us. Thank you. Okay, so this is the yellow one. There's two groups that have yellows. This group's going to walk it for us, and then both groups will give us their story. So. All right, so uh, we have flexibility versus consistency. Uh, kind of just in general the comfort that consistency provides versus kind of being an adaptable company. We think of kind of Netflix versus Blockbuster. Um, and a lot of times you only think of the negatives of consistency. So the fact that Netflix is adaptable pretty much just pushed Blockbuster out of the market. You think, oh, consistency is always a negative. However, it does have some positives that we'll point out. So uh, just starting off with the positives of flexibility, um, we have that it's more interesting for some associates. So some associates like the change. Um, and they like the flexibility. Um, you have the ability to give customers exactly what they want. So as customers' needs change, which is faster than it has been, um, you're able to adapt. Um, going off of that, it's easier to adapt to new requirements. It's uh, similar to the idea of what customers want, but maybe if government regulations change, it's a lot 
laws change, uh, companies are able to adapt to that, kind of like what we've been talking about. Um, and then lastly, you can shift your resources as priorities change, so you kind of have some slack there on what you have internally. Um, you can move pieces around a bit uh, so that you know if something changes, you're able to adapt and, and uh, keep your business going. Nice. All right. So the four negatives to downsides of flexibility are trying to meet everyone's needs can lead to overly complex solutions. And extreme variation increases time and cost to blame. And solution for all is rarely the perfect solution for anyone. And lastly, requires time to evaluate many ideas, as many ideas. And then on the consistency side, um, so for all the upsides, first and foremost, it's more predictable, efficient, and economical. Um, this also feels safer for some associates because there is a pattern in place. Uh, everything's very the same. Um, there are compatible processes that are easier to connect or entertain. And then you can anticipate resource and implementation needs as well. And then for the negatives for consistency, can feel restrictive to some associates. Um, can discourage further improvements or changes. Um, individualized processes can be hard to connect or optimize. And then processes can be duplicated or redundant. Yes, and then on the, can discourage further improvements or changes. Why? Why does having a, a real focus on consistency discourage even improvements? Kind of like what you were saying with the whole frog idea. Some people are just so set. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It also takes so long to get everyone to agree to anything in the first time. The last thing you want to do is change it, <laughs> right? Is this very real? And some of you have had your internships already. Can you see these real life things playing out? Can you see some people who are frog people and some people who are horse people on these things? Yeah, yeah, it's very real. Well done. Yes, just keep um, them on here. I'm going to challenge the <laughs> Go for it. can be um, duplicated or redundant, um, especially for like, Manual labor processes, that's a really good thing for it to be the same process every single time. So people are used to doing exactly what you're doing. Um, and also, if you know that process, you can apply it to another area, which I think yeah, that, that's what that card is. So that could be a positive. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well done. Yeah. Nice. That's, you're getting a lot of head nods. <laughs> yeah? I think the resource duplication can be even a negative for flexibility. When we talked about companies might have different physical compensation and they're not really sharing resources. Very true. That does uh, happen at a company I know real well, actually. <laughs> yes. And we do too much of that. We do. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you, we're an innovation company to the point that we love it and we are working really hard on what would make sense to be consistent. <laughs> now, it's, it's ironic because we're also a medical device company and we have the FDA and we are absolutely precise about it and yet we have this attitude of revering flexibility. Nice. Well done. Let's leave them on here because the next group can tell us their story. The yellow, other yellow group, tell us. You don't have to walk it, but you can just say, uh, oh, it'd be lovely if you would. Go for it. Walk it. There you go. <laughs> tell us your example. <laughs> the example we brought up uh, was about a company called Hasbro, so they make toys. Uh, so it's a very traditional company. You would think about it. They make you know, toys for 80 plus years. Yeah. Um, their biggest competitor is Mattel. They do like Barbie, so it's a bad toy. So okay. currently, what's happening with technology is Kids are now you know, resorting to smartphones and tablets as other forms of entertainment. So what Hasbro has done, instead of being, you know, they were over here very consistent making the toys for decades, uh -huh. uh, they're moving more towards now having like digitally embedded toys so you can kind of interact with them through your smartphone or tablet. So they're moving more towards like the flexibility side. So they're still making traditional toys, but at the same time making other you know, products, whereas Mattel has stuck to their, their roots and now they're 
kind of declining because nobody really wants the traditional Barbie as much anymore versus you know other digitally embedded products. So if you're really walking it, so you're saying that the, for years that they both started here, yeah, they both started here, and Mattel is experiencing the decline because they're not changing. Correct. They're staying consistent, mm -hmm. so they're failing down there. But Hasbro was here. What made them change though? Something, some they don't usually go straight to there. Right. What 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 happened over here that made them go up there? So they like, um, well, I believe like after the recession they realized that you know their basic share. So Amazon was taking off, and okay. other you know technology companies were coming into play, and they realized that their sales for traditional toys were yeah. just declining. So they like mapped out this twenty year plan to get to more not technology based company, but more towards yeah. what do customers want nowadays versus nice. you know stick to making you know yeah. stuffed animals. So erosion of market share in the consistent line yeah. caused them to go up there and become more flexible. Right. Nice, nice. Great example. Thank you. Well done. Yellow group, please. Golf clap. Yes, indeedy. Okay. What do we what do we have left? We have the kind of creamy colored one. Okay. And the, and our green. Okay. Awesome. Good. Good job. <laughs> so positive for uh, global decision making. So brand integrity across all products and businesses, reduce cost and complexity through scaling investments, consistent responses to large global customers and integrated systems produce valuable data for analysis. Uh, but the negatives of global decision making uh, can be different approaches to products and pricing can confuse or anger customers. Uh, enterprise solutions require broad input and take longer to create. Um, inconsistencies can drive cost and complexi complexity and possible compromise solution that doesn't fit any of them. Let's pause there. Because it got a mix. So can, does anybody have what this? Do you get what the scenario is here? Okay, so you get Ford, and they Ford's a Ford, a Ford, a Ford, a Ford everywhere. Okay, and yet, and what's an example of a company that does a lot of local variation? Yes, they do some <laughs> with the products. Yes, um, free to lay, right? It comes to mind, right? Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> Oreo's gone crazy lately. <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> Have you seen them? They're even different colors now. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, like, like GMC, we're seeing with the car example, they have a completely different European brand that's more like compact. Yes. Like yep. And they, like, they have just Texas trucks. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, they have Texas trucks. They don't even sell them anywhere else. So the idea here, though, is that if you have the global decision making, then you're going to be saying, we're making this decision for everybody, no matter what you think you need locally. Okay, so that's the scenario. So now double check on their, not, their negatives and make sure that those all fit. Which one? Do you got one? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so do you get inconsistencies if you've made a decision for your whole global system? The, no. the, the, the inconsistencies would be on this side. Yeah, I, get, I guess we kind of frame that in the, the light that like if you're making a global decision, since it, you're getting, it's harder to share information, so it could be like inconsistency with communication and all that. But I always get that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So th this presents an over-controlled system for a complex world. Where are you going with that? I also say that different approaches to problems. Yeah, or they couldn't even service it. Or, <laughs> right, right. Drive the 
very good. So you see, so obviously so you get the idea, but I hear what you're saying. And notice, this is even interesting from our last one, the example that we got on the Hasbro was that the business model failed, not that the product was failing. The business model was failing, and then they had to alter the product in order to make, you know, a, a reasonable living. So this, okay, so what do you got in the, this, oh, these over here? Up here. Okay. <laughs> um, so we had faster response to individual competitive moves. Okay. Um, we said that faster yes. and more individualized responses to specific customers would be the benefit for the decision making. Yes. We said knowledge based decision making optimizes customer relationships. And we yeah. also said that solutions tailored for, uh, it creates solutions tailored for region based decisions. Nice. Yeah. You can all see that, can't you? Great. And what are you seeing for downsides of local? All right. For downsides of local decision making, it, uh, you know, there's multiple approaches can damage value and product position in other regions. And then uh, it can create reluctance to change after significant investment to create a single solution. You said the reluctance on the local or yeah. the local? There you go. Yes. Good, good check. Good check. Good. <laughs> Anything else that you want to adapt since you all did the same one? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well spotted. So what was your example? I mean, we, co we covered a few, or did you already? We talked yeah. about Don. Yeah, we talked about Don. Okay, so tell us. So the, the brand integrity, um, like yes. keep it, like everyone knows in the world what the gold markets are. Yes. So keeping that consistent um, yes. through everything. But also, the way they use local decision making, the solutions tailored for regions and markets, like we can't sell beef in India. Yeah. So They do, yeah. This is a nice example. So the example you're giving is a company that is living with the polarity, really capitalizing on all they can over there and still adapting for local markets. Nice example. Thank you. Great. And our other group that had the same one, what did you decide? Uh, what was your story, your example? We have a story with Home Depot. Um, so it's from my supply chain class. So in the past, Home Depot was very local. They, uh, so they have different supply chain managers that would buy like um, decorations from local suppliers oh, to yeah. kind of tailor that need. So a store, a Home Depot store in Texas would probably be different in yes. Colorado or Minnesota. And then when they had a new CEO, they decided to standardize their processes and they integrated everything and say one supply chain team would buy products for all the stores. And so things became more standardized. So even though uh, it became more efficient, they lost customer service and things like that. Mm -hmm. and so that was nice. Local Great example, and what I love about that example is that when you're in the company, it, we call it going guardrail to guardrail. So they were really getting the value of this one, and then someone new comes in and say, no, all the way over there, instead of the McDonald's thing where you say, how can we do the best of both? Okay, nice, great example. Thank you, and we have one more golf club for this one. Yeah. If they're okay. <laughs> Good, okay, because I, okay, thank you. You're right. Good, okay, so head back. Just uh, don't worry about supplies. We'll do that at, and let's just do some quick slides. Am I able to use this myself, just yes. from where I am? You just push that one to go forward. Okay, good. All right, we're going to go quickly, but the slides can, will be posted. Okay, so let me just add a little color commentary to it, but, um, You've experienced it now. So what we look at when we're working with our technology associates in particular is the difference between a polarity versus a problem. The polarities have interdependent alternatives. You've, they, they both serve. They both serve the other, even though they're opposites. And, and so what we notice we have a polarity because they're ongoing. And if you hear someone say, didn't we just have this conversation eight years ago? The chances are that you're working with a polarity, not a problem. It's never going to go away. In my company, it will never go away that we will always be trying to balance innovation and effectiveness. We, we must have consistent global processes, and yet we're innovating, which then make those processes need to be revised yet again. We, it was a problem 50 years ago. It'll be a problem 50 years from now. Therefore, it's a polarity, not a problem. Are you, you with me? It's not going away. 
You just have to be agile. They're not solvable, so they have to be managed. And so we call it requiring both and thinking. We need effectiveness and innovation, not or. A problem, on the other hand, is independent. It can end. It can be solved. It might be big and difficult, but it can be solved. And that you choose this solution or this solution. These are examples, which I will give you. And then I have another one that uh, some of you might be really interested in. This is a, a Polarities in Engineers Without Borders failure report. These were all the failures that they had reported, and they're all polarities, every single one of them. And uh, I don't know if you know what Engineers Without Borders is, but it's like Doctors Without Borders, and we send some of our younger engineers to places where they, they need that kind of assistance. You can look up those. OK, so this is why it, it's angst-filled. Usually, people get really attached to whether it's a frog or a horse. You know, and they really think you're wrong if they can't see it. That's why I wanted you to be sure that every single person saw it before we moved on. And notice how you even helped each other. Some of you like said, take a look back. Look at it from a different view. Let's hang with this till we at least see both sides. And that's actually how we do it at work. So we had a very significant business team that was just in raw conflict. And a, a person came in to facilitate and said, shall we try mapping it? And if we mapped it, what would we call the two poles? Because the challenge is, is that you've got to be sure the two things are neutral. If you already have a preference, you might name something the negative. I'll give you an example. So our company has uh, got a pretty harmonious culture, but we are going a little too far. Now, what would be the downside of too much harmony? Give me a few examples. Group think? Yeah? Yeah. Just figure out all sorts of ways of saying group think, I guess. But it's really true. Too much harmony. It's just, you know, you just didn't go for the right decision. You didn't go, you weren't bold enough. And so someone called it a culture of nice. And I'm like, I said, oh boy, I don't want that to stick, because that would not be useful, because there's a lot about this that's good. So they, said they wanted to put culture of nice as one of the poles. No, that's already the downside of inclusive decision making versus individual decision making. If I gave you that, anyone in the room could map the upsides and downside of inclusive decision making as a group versus an individual making the decision. So you have to be very careful when you name your polls to make sure they're neutral. They both have value, okay, equal value. So the thing is, we fear something we value. It's important to work toward the upsides of both. It is as true as night follows day that if you overemphasize one of these, you will experience the negative of that side. So it pays to take the time to call them out, to name them both and to make very clear decisions, like McDonald's did, great example, where they said, operational excellence is number one for us because we, it's for the brand and it's for our ability to just deliver in places that are difficult to deliver in, and we're gonna do just enough local customization that we're still relevant. You follow it? By naming them, they could do something great. You have to name them first, do the analysis of what the upsides are, and see how can you actually produce the conditions for getting the best of both. The only thing that would make it wrong is if it's against your company values. I mean, you know, that is a huge part of the work we do when we define who we are as a company. So there's not just the, the mission, but the, you know, there's mission, there's values, there's purpose. I mean, all that's part of the mix. But usually it's not a wrong, it's a, it's an and. That's the hard part. It's an and, not an or. So there are two truths in every polarity, but neither is the full truth. So when we use this for strategy, we call it the invisible and, where usually you're saying, we are committed to doing this, and if you don't find out what your and is, it will find you. It comes up from behind, and it's awful. <laughs> so it's really powerful in, in strategy to find both. So what we try to remember is not even calling it managing or navigating polarities, but we call it optimizing polarities. Just some examples. This was my uh, dissertation research at Gore. And I, when I studied um, 
we have a, a role called sponsor, and so sponsors and leaders are in support roles to our innovators. And I had my data, and half of it was on one side of the table, and the other half was on the other side. And I said, where, where are findings in this? And that was the finding. So some of our innovators said that the best way um, that they could be uh, supported in their work was, uh, I'll get, look at the second one there. It's kind of interesting. Some of them said that when their leader would give them air cover, that allowed them to do their best innovation work. And air cover was uh, defined as keeping the business not knowing what they're doing until the innovation is clear enough to be valuable that it would get support. So they like keeping them hidden. Half of the innovators said, oh, what I might need my leader to do is I don't know how to get visibility for a good idea. Well, those are two opposite things, keeping me hidden, putting me out in the limelight, but it was split. So what would happen with each innovator, some of them loved being challenged more, some of them loved being supported more. Some wanted visibility, some wanted air cover. Some wanted help for diverging. Some said, oh, I got a million ideas, I need help to pick the right ones, converging. And so this was this set of conditions. What was interesting is no one person had the exact same combination, which is why our culture works, is because we can do things for individuals. We're loose enough to, and so what my finding was is that we created micro environments around our innovators where they had the perfect conditions for them, but they were all polarities. This one is, I think, would relate to many of you as you are in this age group, this, this cohort. Um, tensions to consider for millennials. Are we in a company that's more about profit or purpose? Controlling or empowering? Now, even the word or is wrong, isn't it? <laughs> Planning and emergence. Hierarchies and networks. Efficiency, adaptivity, privacy, transparency. Boy, is that one we're all living, isn't it? You feel the tension, you're supposed to feel the tension. Yeah, but the thing is, in the right organization and the right practices and the right people with the right skills, that tension becomes creative tension, and that produces tremendous innovation. So this is what I would have, this is what I had my leaders do last week. I would just challenge you with the time the way it is to think about something in your career that you're choosing that you can identify right now will be one of those polarities that will be with you for your whole career. Never solvable, always intriguing, and with tremendous uh, potential tension and therefore innovation. And then um, what I'd, I'd just like to end with these images. Why would we take a look at the different activities? What are they about? Balance, and the more you engage in activities that have to do with balance, the more you develop your, your core. And, and so this ability that you're practicing today is one that will give you a core that others do not have. They cannot even start to hold those two ideas in mind. So I'm going to both challenge and curse you at the same time by saying notice them. They're everywhere. I mean, by, by the time you go to bed tonight, you're going to see at least three polarities that you've been living with and maybe not acknowledging. But I hope that you can learn to really make them part of your professional skill set. Okay? Hey, 320? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.